welcome to another in a series of summer conversations. I think this time we'll begin with a few minutes of silent worship. In 1899, 400 Quakers gathered here for the 200th anniversary of this meeting. From then time to now, this meeting has just diminished and become silent. But for years, people met here in the silence to remember the spirit that gave us birth, the spirit that created us, all of us, that profound spirit that sustains us and that calls us to work for the common good in the future. Let us have a few minutes of silent worship together. Have you here? There'll be another of these evenings, the last of this summer series, in two Thursdays. And um, <coughs> Andrea Rue, an anthropologist, will speak. We hope you'll join us for that final of this summer series. We're hoping to develop some of these this winter and spring. And the evaluation forms that I think some of you had a chance to pick up, if you have suggestions, for this coming series, please make them there. We would like to get a community dialogue going across all the divisions that are in our midst. It's the least we can do in the face of the shadows hanging over this earth, shadows hanging over creation. Thank you. I want to introduce our speaker tonight. I had a lovely afternoon with him. You know what he's going to do next Thursday? in New Jersey where he lives. He's going with other people from his mosque to work at a homeless shelter. Soup kitchen. Yeah. You can straighten me out if I make mistakes along the way. <laughs> One of my stereotypes about Islam is that Islamic people are to stay to themselves and don't mix very well in our, in our world. Well, Dr. Chaudhry, in a few minutes, dispelled that today. He was the first Pakistani-born mayor of an American city in New Jersey. Bernard Township, 2004. He served on school committees. He served on the Board of Education in Basking Ridge. He was a board member of the Family Services of Morris County in New Jersey. This is just, these are just a few of his extraordinary efforts in public service to work for the public common good. For 30 years, he worked with AT&T. He was the CFO of the Public Relations Division of AT&T for some years. And at retirement, he's been teaching. He's uh, an economist. London School of Economics, honors, first off. Then he came to Tufts and got a PhD. He teaches at, at Rutgers. He's the director of the Rutgers Business Center. He was the campus college chair of the University of Phoenix at their campus in Jersey City. He was part of the economics faculty at the University of Phoenix, which seems to be all over the country. <laughs> He has a huge family, most of whom are in Pakistan. And he talked about his mother in the same terms that I talk about mine, who's in Canada and far off and elderly. He cares for his family. <coughs> After 9-11, Dr. Ali Chaudhry became very active and he started something, the Center for Understanding Islam. He was one of the founding members to counter extremism. And he speaks all over the country. He's been on Fox News and CBS, on WABC radio, online, a religious show. He was at Cape Cod Community College this spring, making, I think, a, a special lecture. He's working tirelessly to talk about Islam. 
And most of us, if you're like me, <coughs> I know a little about Islam, but I have a lot, of, a lot of stereotypes. I didn't realize that Islamic people are building huge numbers of schools in New Jersey. That there's, a, that there's a large, very active population of Islamic people in this country, many of whom are very successful, many of whom are very committed to make our society work, deepen, and work better. So we're very happy to have you come tonight to be with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. As most of you know, that is the Islamic greeting, which means peace be upon you. And I think I heard many of you say, and peace be upon you, which is wa alaikum assalam in Arabic. Um, I really want to thank uh, Kevin and, of course, the entire organization uh, for inviting me to be a part of these conversations. And as a Muslim, as an American, I feel an obligation to respond to requests like this because we think this is an opportunity that doesn't come very often. And we want to make sure that uh, we are there to uh, answer questions and dispel many of the stereotypes that uh, Peter just talked about. Uh, what I would like to do is when I first uh, spoke to uh, Kevin, uh, who could have imagined that I'll be talking on the day when there is a war raging? And then this morning as I woke up and I was getting ready to leave for my train and I listened to the radio and we had this alleged plot to destroy planes. And these are the kinds of challenges that we feel within the community as well as within the general American uh, community. And we have been working very hard to, at both ends, really. Uh, and the Center for Understanding Islam was created within about 10 days of 9 11. We sat down, a few of us, and we felt that it was so critical that we go out and talk to people about Islam and about Muslims. And you'll be surprised that we quickly realized how much more we had to learn ourselves about our faith before we would go out and talk to others. Secondly, many of us who consider ourselves moderate, very open-minded, uh, liberal, whatever labels you want to attach, began to realize that there are elements in our community that still have such extreme views based on ignorance or just simply lack of interest about the rest of the world. So we basically set out on a dual mission. And that was first to educate ourselves about our faith, work within our own communities, going to the mosque, meeting with the leadership, and talking to them about what it means to be an American and what it means to be an American Muslim. And this whole issue of how the world views Islam and Muslims uh, needed to be dealt with from the inside. Because I'm a firm believer that the best way we can present the correct image of Islam and offer the, the, uh, the message is by personal example. So we needed to create people, uh, teams, who would be willing to do that. And so that has taken a lot of effort, a lot of time, and we've been uh, working very hard to train others uh, to go to events like this uh, where I cannot be there or one of the other leaders cannot be, they go. So that has been a major challenge. But at the same time, you know, we've been facing constant barrage of events that happen, of course, and nobody can control those. And we are constantly called upon them to respond. And the most common question that we get, I don't hear Muslims condemning terrorism. How come I don't hear Muslims condemning 
uh, you know, suicide bombings and things like that. I can give you an example of a book club meeting that I went to. Uh, I happened to be on the uh, board of the public library in our town as a member of the township committee. Uh, part of my obligation is to be a liaison to some of the boards. So I attend the zoning board meetings and planning board meetings and the library board uh, and some of the community service activities. So at this book club, we had three women who had come to Basking Ridge to talk about a particular book. And at the end of that discussion, this lady turns to me and said, how come I haven't heard any Muslims condemning terrorism? So that's a challenge for us because the fact is that right after 9-11, all of the major organizations in the world, including the leading university, Al-Azhar in Cairo, Egypt, its leader came out with a statement condemning. We issued statements uh, condemning terrorism. I have served, as I said, as a, a spokesperson on the WABC Religion on the Line program, which sometimes you may hear in this area as well, that's run by Rabbi Patasnik and uh, Father Paul Keenan. And they used to have a Presbyterian minister also, uh, Dr. Paul Schaefer, who is no longer part of the program. Uh, and on that program, I have condemned suicide bombing and asked, answered questions from people and so forth. And yet we hear the same thing, that how come people haven't done that? I would like to just read one of the statements to you, which is fairly reflective of what people have been saying and what Muslims need to be conveying to their neighbors, to their co-workers, to their friends, or whoever is uh, in search of, of answers. And that is a petition that has now been signed by hundreds of thousands of Muslims uh, around the world uh, that has been circulated. And this is what it says. We, the undersigned Muslims, wish to state clearly that those who commit acts of terror, murder, and cruelty in the name of Islam are not only destroying innocent lives, but are also betraying the values of the faith they claim to represent. No injustice done to Muslims can ever justify the massacre of innocent people, and no act of terror will ever serve the cause of Islam. We repudiate and disassociate ourselves from any Muslim group or individual who commits such brutal and un-Islamic acts. We refuse to allow our faith to be held hostage by the criminal actions of a tiny minority acting outside the teachings of both the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. As it states in the Quran, a holy book, O you who believe, stand firmly for justice as witnesses to God, even if it be against yourselves or your parents or your kin, and whether it be against rich or poor, for God can best protect both. Do not follow any passion lest you not be just. And if you distort or decline to do justice, verily God is well acquainted with all that you do. And that is the message, and in many other words, Muslims certainly in New Jersey where I have been active, also reacted to specific events. For example, when a New Jersey resident was killed in Saudi Arabia, uh, killed in Iraq or in other places. Uh, the community came together and bought an ad in the newspaper. Uh, in individual names, simply saying that we condemn this act and nobody can do this in the name of Islam. And yet, of course, there are people who are doing it, who call themselves Muslims. And that's the challenge for us to work not only within uh, America, but also uh, in other countries where some of that hatred is, uh, is brewing. And I'd like to come back to that one towards the end of my presentation here in how do we go about doing that? And do, in fact, some of the things we are doing help or hinder in that process? 
Because one of the challenges we face is that while we would like to do the right thing, and you try to approach people in the mosque and the leadership and try to convince them that they should not allow people who come with uh, hateful messages from outside to come and speak at their mosques, they will come back to us and say, look what's happening. Look how they're killing Muslims all over the world. They are attacking this country or that country. And uh, they're destroying their homes. They're turning them out of their homes and killing people, children, innocent children, men and women. And then how can you justify that? How can you uh, speak on their behalf? We don't speak on behalf of anyone committing violence. Islam is, and as I will come to in a, in a moment, is a religion of peace, advocates peace and tolerance. Uh, and as, as I said, I will you know, share with some of the beliefs that, that you'll hopefully get an appreciation of that one. Uh, but that makes it very, very hard. And an event like this today, for example, more people are now, of course, asking. And the other source of challenge that we get is from talk radio, which really has become hate radio. I mean, you listen to some of these programs. I listen to them only to just to see what they're saying uh, and what we need to be prepared to deal with. And you just can't believe that these people can go to sleep at night after saying those things, knowing them to be utterly untrue. And yet, because Islam bashing and Muslim bashing is not fashionable, and they want to get as many listeners as possible to uh, get the advertisers to pay them more money, they will use anything. And sometimes I do call in and try to correct them. Uh, but then, of course, you know, you, you know that their uh, message is basically just keep repeating what, uh, what they have to say. And another source of concern sometimes we get is from the evangelical Christian community. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Pat Robertson and uh, Franklin Graham and Jerry Falwell have made some statements. And generally, we have tried to meet with them, tried to talk to them, explain to them, but they have their own agenda. Uh, so we say to people that when you listen to those kinds of comments, step back a little bit and think about historically and scripturally how many things Islam, Judaism, and Christianity have in common as opposed to some of the differences. And then if you also look back and you're really honest with yourself, dealing with the whole issue of violence and suicide bombing and, and, and the killing that have been going on, and people claiming that somehow every Muslim just wants to kill Christians or kill Jews, that that's somehow in the, in the teachings that is in the Quran, and you know, people make baseless statements. You have to sort of look back and look at the history of the relations between Muslims, Jews, and Christians. We won't have the time today to, to get into those, but I'll be happy to answer any questions when it comes to that. But I just wanted to leave this topic by saying that when you listen to people making those comments, uh, step back a little bit and say, what do, who, do I know a Muslim who I can ask What's the truth? Reach out to somebody because honestly people are willing to come and speak to you. They will be willing to provide information. Now, you may run into some who have the, some, some of the extreme views. It's possible. But most of the time you will find that people at least will share with you their belief. And then you can judge for yourself. And at least take the time to read about it, learn more, so that you can make the decisions yourself, rather than having the media kind of dictate you know, what the public should think. As a matter of fact, one of, the third, one of the other sources of concern that we get, that we deal with, is politicians. In New Jersey, I've had to deal with uh, former Governor McGreevy, uh, former Senator, U.S. Senator Robert Torricelli on these kinds of issues when they made statements that were fed to them uh, about Islam and about Muslim groups that were absolutely untrue. Governor McGreevy had to 
meet with the community, and publicly apologize. He said, I made a mistake. Well, he made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and uh, Robert Torricelli ended up, but just as recently as this uh, election cycle, three days before the Tuesday vote in Georgia, there was a congressional contest, as you know, Cynthia McKinney, and a gentleman by the name of uh, Johnson, Hank Johnson. Hank Johnson actually won the debate. And Hank Johnson made the following comment. On a public television program, not, not public television, on one of the cable shows where they were being interviewed in a debate. He said, but since we are talking about Middle East policy, because McKinney had made a point about Middle East policy issues, that she disagreed with the policies of the administration and that it should be changed. Mr. Johnson says, but since we are talking about Middle East policy, I will say that the abundant number of contributors to Mrs. McKinney's campaign are, have Palestinian and Arab surnames. Now, I could accuse her of being under the control of terrorists. These are people who are going to make laws that govern this nation. I'm an elected official. I ran for the municipal government township committee seat two months after November 11, uh, September 11, in 2001. Not a single person in my community ever asked what my faith was. But we are hearing these kinds of things because people find this a convenient way of getting people to rally around their cause because it's fashionable to do that. But I don't know why people don't think that honesty is important in public office. Um, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine, uh, a, uh, a Hasidic a Jew, Rabbi, who has a, um, a center in Basking Ridge, whom I have been meeting with regularly, because we were brought together by a, th a third person who uh, also wanted to, a, a Catholic, uh, two Jews, and a Muslim, would meet monthly at the uh, Rabbi's home for breakfast to talk about different things. And he told me once that when you were running for election in 2001, there were some people that came to him and said, should we vote for him? And he told me this, and I totally believe him. He said, if you were going to vote for Ali Chaudhry on September 10th, then you should vote for him today. Because he's the same person. You know him as a member of this community. Look at what he's done, what he says, what he stands for, and so forth, rather than this broad brush painting of everyone with the same brush as terrorists. So the point is that there are honest people who would stand up because that's important to them. But unfortunately, most of the time, we get people carried away who do that. Now, I would like to do two other things. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you uh, some basic concepts about Islam. Our belief system, the foundation of our faith, and where we get our guidance from. And then I'd like to talk about the current situation and how we need to be dealing with, I'm not a foreign policy expert, but as an individual American, I have an opinion. And as an American Muslim, I have an opinion. I'd like to share that with you. And of course, we'll be happy to take any questions on any topic that, that, that you would like to talk, uh, uh, talk about. So frankly, I'm uh, you know, grateful for this opportunity to be able to do this uh, because it is so important and these opportunities are so rare. So let's first begin with the meaning of Islam. How many would say that they know the word uh, the, the meaning of the word Islam, just by show of hands. Okay, two or three people in the group. 
Islam comes from a word in Arabic that means submission to the will of God. That's the first basic meaning. The second and essential meaning of Islam is peace. The, the submission to the will of God means that someone who does that, who submits to the will of God, is called a Muslim. So the label itself is less important than the actual faith and submission to the will of God as one God, as one creator. So to be a Muslim, you essentially just have to declare, and that's the first pillar of Islam, and in Arabic, it is to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is no deity but God, whose Arabic name happens to be Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger. And very briefly, I'd just like to say three things about that declaration. First and foremost, every individual Muslim is making that declaration directly to God, to no one else. And he's a, he or she is accountable directly to God for that commitment. Number two, the God who we call in Arabic Allah, we sincerely and truly believe is the same God, the same almighty creator that Christians and Jews believe in. Or anyone who believes in a, in a being uh, that created us all for a purpose and gave us certain responsibilities uh, and obligations is the same God. So when Franklin Graham or Pat Robertson or Falwell says things that our God or even uh, some people in the Defense Department would make statements as, and even Ashcroft once said, their God and our God. I said, there is no difference. Now, I will tell you that I've been at interfaith meetings with, with the priests. And after several meetings, one of the priests did say to me, just by saying that Muslims worship the same God doesn't do it for me. So I'm still working on it. <laughs> Trying to explain what it means. So it is hard, but that's the, the essence. That is the same creator. Okay. Number three, that we believe in Prophet Muhammad as the messenger of God, just like we must believe in Prophet Jesus, Moses, Abraham. And as you all know, Abraham is the father of all three monotheistic religions. And Muslims trace their roots to Abraham just as Jews do and just as Christians do. So that is where our teachings and foundations come from. Number two. I would just like to share with you the sources of our guidance for this and to practice this faith that we have just accepted or agreed you know, to, uh, to, uh, to commit to are essentially three sources. First and foremost is the Holy Quran, which we believe to be the revealed word of God through angel Gabriel or Jibrail in, in Arabic revealed to Prophet Muhammad, who then recited it over and over again. It was written down and compiled in a book. And that book is unchanging. It is, of course, the original is in Arabic. It is available in any language now, but the Arabic has never been changed. Arabic, no matter what part of the world you go to, you'll pick up an Arabic text. It'll be exactly the same uh, as anywhere else in the world. Uh, so we believe that to be our source, main source of guidance. Second source, and a very important source, are the sayings and the examples of the life of the prophet. These are known as hadith. Hadith would be a collection of sayings that have been collected and authenticated. And in fact, they have been put into books and organized in a way that some are considered to be more authentic than others, depending upon who was the reciter, who was the source, and how many other people confirmed it. Based on that, so you have absolutely true statements 
or the prophet that, you, that are firmly you know, authenticated, others that are less so, and so forth. So that's the second source. The third source is known as ijtihad, and that is, it's sort of derived from the word jihad, which I will also come to in a moment. Uh, but ijtihad means the scholarly work of our scholars in Islam who have un read and understood the Quran, and read and understood the traditions of the Prophet and what he said and what he did in his life, and then interpreted that for Muslims. And that work continues today. That has never stopped. I wish it had made more progress, so it was more available, but that work continues today. In fact, what we are doing right now is a part of that ijtihad, that is trying to interpret the teachings of the Quran and Hadith and our own, in our own lives and for others uh, who wish to understand it. So that ijtihad continues, and I call that the intellectual jihad, okay? Because there are other meaning of jihad that I'll come to. So this is sort of the intellect. So there are, so there are three sources that we rely on. Next, I would like to mention to you, and I think this may be helpful because I actually I love the idea of the silent prayer. Uh, because if you've observed Muslim prayers, most of them are silent. There are some sections where the imam recites loudly and you hear and you follow the imam, but most of the prayers that we perform are actually done in silence because you are directly communicating with God on your own from your heart. And frequently we close our eyes when we do that too, and I noticed that uh, people were really concentrating on that. So it's very, very important. So I'd like to just share with you the basic prayer that is repeated in every single unit of prayer that we offer. I like to recite it in Arabic, and then I'll read it in English. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, praise be to God, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds, most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment. Thee do we worship and thine aid we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, those whose portion is not wrath and who go not astray. Amen. That is repeated in every single unit of prayer that we offer. In the interest of time, I will skip the details of the prayers. We'll be happy to answer any questions afterward. Uh, but these prayers are five daily prayers, and then there are some traditional uh, additional prayers that are held. Our congregational prayers, however, is on Friday, uh, held in the midday. And uh, the purpose of that is a community prayer where men are expected to leave their work and go. Women are certainly welcome to come, but they're not required because of the family obligation. Because if they have children at home, family responsibilities at home, they're not required, but they are welcome and they do. Many of the mosques you will find women coming and, uh, and, and praying. So that's the second pillar of Islam, very important foundation. The third pillar of Islam is psalm, it's called fasting. Fasting, as you know, and the Quran clearly says that in the second chapter, that fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for people before you, because we know it was prescribed for Jews and Christians, and many do uh, still practice them in different forms. And I had just recently learned from a Jewish friend that there are practices that we have during the month of Ramadan, in the last 10 days of Ramadan, that they have, that I was never aware of, because we don't, don't talk as much. 
And so I'm learning a lot of things that people practice. There's so many common things for the same purpose. Same purpose. That is, you come together uh, and you go to a place where there is no other distraction and you're simply concentrating on prayer uh, for several days. The fourth pillar of Islam is charity. And this actually comes very close to the, the service mission that I know you very strongly believe in and we do too. Zakat, which is charity, is an important pillar and it is required that every year, at the end of the year, a Muslim gives two and a half percent of their wealth, not income, wealth, uh, for charity. And that money cannot be used to build mosques, it cannot be used to pay an imam, it can only be used for charity, it can only be used for the poor. And mosques do regularly collect that money and it is used for those purposes. Now, I'd just like to add a footnote to that. For a long, long time, Muslims felt, traditionally, people who had grown up in, uh, in the Middle East or Pakistan or India, living here, collecting money, and then giving it to different uh, places, felt that it could only be given to Muslims. But then many of us raised the question. I said, the, the idea of zakat was to help your community where you live. Because the prophet said, if you go to bed, knowing that your neighbor is hungry, then you haven't done your job. And somebody asked him, what do you mean by neighbor? Who's my neighbor? And his definition was 40 houses in every direction. That's your neighbor. So we said, and so now we have imams who have come out and issued fatwas to say that it is absolutely legitimate and proper to give aid to non-Muslims. Zakat money can be used for that purpose, and it is being used. And one of the things, as uh, Peter mentioned earlier, we are saying that not only giving money like that, but actually service, like serving in a soup kitchen, uh, which I've been doing now for the last three um, uh, times in a row, and we have made it a, a now a practice to do it every other month uh, to go to this, uh, this particular. Uh. The um, last pillar of Islam is Hajj, called pilgrimage. Uh, which is once in your lifetime, those who are able and financially uh, can afford it uh, are required to go and perform uh, the pilgrimage. And the significance of pilgrimage is where you see the diversity of the Muslim community, you see every color, every language spoken, uh, and every culture represented in the world. And in fact, remember that was the one event that changed Malcolm X. And he became a true Sunni Muslim, understanding the true faith, and began and actually changed the black Muslim community almost entirely, with very few exceptions now with Farrakhan. Uh, but mostly, uh, they, they are following the mainstream Islam. Now, I have just a few minutes left. Uh, I would like to uh, say a few words about jihad, and then some comments about what we think we need to do to win the hearts and minds of the Muslim community, and how do we deal with this constant uh, contention uh, that, that we have? Jihad, I would just share with you three meanings. First, in essence, jihad means self-struggle. The origin of this concept actually in the Quran that is talked about is struggling with yourself to understand the word of God, following it, and being the best that you can be as a human being and performing the function that you know, God asks you to do. That's the essential meaning. The second meaning is when you are attacked, and the Quran specifically talks about that, that when you are attacked, and you are oppressed, and you're being turned out of your homes, you are then allowed to take up arms <coughs> and fight back. Only defensive. But even then, there are restrictions. There are uh, rules of engagement. If you are fighting, you are not allowed to uh, kill women kill children, kill old people, and if the opponent gives up, you have to stop, give, uh, stop fighting. And also, in fact, if, the, uh, if someone who's fighting you runs away and seeks refuge in the home of uh, your opponent, you cannot go into that home. You cannot follow that person into the home because they've given up. The Quran specifically talks about making peace when people want to make peace when they don't want to fight you anymore. You only can fight when they do. The third meaning of a, uh, jihad 
is the one that I mentioned earlier, ijtihad. That is the intellectual jihad. That is continue to work hard to understand uh, the purpose that God created you for, what does the will of God mean, and, and follow that, and follow the teachings of the prophet. I have a lot of notes, but I want to get to one particular um, piece that I want to share with you, and that has to do with my emphasis on the fact that Islam teaches that peace can be achieved through justice. As you heard me say earlier in the beginning, establish justice. You read the Torah, you shall establish justice. You read the Quran, you shall, you know, focus is on justice. So I strongly believe that following the teachings of, of, the, uh, of the Quran and the examples of the Prophet, that you have to establish a just society in order to bring about peace. Unfortunately, what is happening now is that we have what we, what in the name of democracy, it sounds like what we have created is what I call demagocracy. What does that mean? In my mind, I just came up with it because thinking about demagoguery because people have demagogued certain issues and have set ideas they don't want to change, they don't want to think about anybody else's concerns or ideas, and they're using the democratic process to have the votes and the power to make decisions and control. That's what I call demagocracy. Unfortunately, it is happening here, and it is now happening, it's being practiced in other places where we are supporting. So I think what we need to do is step back and say, if we really want to be successful in, this, uh, in establishing peace, a peaceful world, then let us create societies that are based on justice. Where everyone feels that there is a prevalent perception of justice so that people can pursue their own uh, best interests. I'm an economist, but I use that term sometimes. The invisible hand, that is, if you let people make their own decisions, they will generally do the right thing as long as there is peaceful existence and there is justice. And by way of a recommendation, my recommendation to the administration, I know uh, Ambassador Karen Hughes has gone around the Muslim world to try to talk to Muslim leaders. I have attended some meeting where she had come and met with the leadership, but not generally with the general population and so forth, and trying to say how can we sell the American, you know, the image of America. Well, you can't sell the image of America the way it is today. You have to work to make sure that you create environments where people understand that you are working for the betterment of everyone and therefore, uh, you know, even-handedly making decisions. So one final comment, and that is, I would say that the best cure for extremism is capitalism. And I'll tell you why. If you create opportunities for young men and women in these poor countries, and I can tell you from Pakistan because I've been there and I've seen things that I grew up there, people who now go to madrasas, who we then say are turned to be extremists and then want, want to become suicide bombers, if you give them an opportunity to get a good education, learn a skill, and be able to produce an income, for their families, they wouldn't be going to the madrasas. So what I'm saying is that what we need to do is use our resources constructively in creating education, which has been the source of success for this country, education and innovation. And if we can make that our mission to help people educate their populations and then give them the opportunity to be self-sufficient and I will end by saying that this uh, kind of thought was also echoed by uh, an American businessman who I believe now lives in Israel, has gone there and established a lot of businesses. And he said on one of the shows exactly what I just said, that once you create opportunities for people <laughs> where they can raise their families in peace and they can work they can educate their kids in, uh, in, in the uh, peaceful environment, they wouldn't think about suicide bombing. 
And that's my message. Islam does not advocate violence. Quran certainly does not, and I have a full paper, and it's also available on the website for the Center for Understanding Islam, which is cuii.org. And uh, uh, I believe I've gone over a couple of minutes, Peter, so I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. That's an excellent question. Let me add a quotation from Bernard Heichel, who's a professor at NYU. And he just wrote an article, and this was in the, uh, I believe in the Times also, uh, or in the, um, in, in, in one of the publications. And he makes the point in the end, he says that, um, he's talking about the, um, the people in the modern world is to educate themselves, that is the, the victory, the real victory of people in the world is to educate themselves and to compete with other nations, uh, not just ourselves, not on the field of battle, but in the sphere of industry, ideas, and innovation. And that's my message. That's what we need to be doing. Yes, it can be done. And the US did it for many years. Many, many years through uh, US aid, through other programs. Uh, through Peace Corps, uh, where we created schools, we provided guidance for people, uh, but we were not consistent. We missed an opportunity in Afghanistan. We, uh, that, which, that has now created a problem for not only for Afghanistan, but Pakistan. And, and people have felt that. And, and I believe that if the uh, US government were to channel its, re its enormous resources that we are now just wasting away uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the killing machines uh, for opportunities like this. And all I'm saying is, I went to the um, earthquake area, by the way, the earthquake affected area in, June, uh, in January. I was visiting Pakistan and we were fortunate to have the um, prime minister's uh, helicopter. So I was actually able to travel to the far end of the uh, Kashmir region, which is right on the border with India. And there's a small village that some doctors had adopted to try to help and I was there to try to figure out how we could help them. And I talked to people there. And they told me about things that they are themselves doing. One man is setting up, or they already have a microcredit scheme where they give three to $400 for each person to set up a new business. They can then support 10 other people. If you give him $1,000, that's 60,000 rupees. That's three businesses. Look what you can do with the money in terms of creating opportunities. They will do the work. I'll give you another example. There was a young lady who, uh, high school graduate, had gone to college, uh, but basically went into trade school and learned sewing. And when the doctors were talking to uh, the group about building the school and helping them with the books and all that, she came up and said, what are you doing for me in terms of uh, what, what we could actually do to help ourselves? She said, buy me sewing machines, six sewing machines, and I'll train every girl in this village to learn how to sew and do embroidery. And then I asked her, I said, what are you gonna do with what they make? How are you gonna sell that? She said, we don't need to sell. There's enough demand locally that they could be self-employed. So I would go one step further though. If we were to go and do something like that, let's provide a, a small market for that to buy their stuff. And there are private groups, by the way, that are doing it. Create the school, send the kids there. You can supervise the program, you can uh, supervise the uh, curriculum, you can get the teachers trained and make sure that they're getting the right message and they're not going to the madrasas. Now, fortunately, the government of Pakistan has taken some steps to control the madrasas. 
they have now required that anyone who wants to run one must have a college degree. It didn't used to be a requirement. Any mullah could open one. It's no longer the case. You now have to show that you have taken general education broad enough so that you can then go to impart the same education to kids who go to that, that kind of a program. Yes, sir. Who decides whether Hezbollah or Israel is just? <laughs> <laughs> there is, I don't know that there is an answer to that question, but let me attempt they one. Would each say that okay? They would say that, okay? But it depends upon, as some people have pointed out, the the view of history that you look at. If you were to look at the history of the last 29 days, what Hezbollah did was absolutely wrong. But the reaction by Israel, which is totally disproportionate, is also wrong. My philosophy in this one is, I had it in my notes, but I didn't get to it, but I want to share that with you now in response to that question. In a dispute, I believe the stronger party has a greater obligation to make room for negotiations because you can afford to do that. There was no reason for Israel to go and start destroying the total infrastructure of that country where, in fact, according to Friedman, according to all the people who have written about Lebanon, here is a country that was an example of what you want to see happen. They worked for decades to get to that after the civil occupation of the Israelis. And they were able to create an economy, create, uh, rebuild their cities, uh, build beautiful restaurants. And so encourage that. Instead of going, I, I just cannot see for the life of me what logic it says that you go and destroy a country to teach a lesson. Teach the wrong lesson. Because the lesson now is, what has happened to Hezbollah? How do you define who is just? Look at the popularity that Hezbollah has gained as a result of that. What do you think they think? Who is just? They feel that they were right. Okay. So similarly, the Israelis would say, well, we have the right to do that, but I would ask my Israeli friends, you had one soldier that was kidnapped that you were trying to bring back. There were two others too, I'll say, three, three altogether, I believe. But in that particular region, there was one, Shalit, right? Two questions. How many... Lebanese and other Palestinians have the Israelis kidnapped and kept in their dungeons. Thousands. Number two, just be very practical. If your goal is to get one person back, how many Israeli lives have been lost for that one life that you were trying to save? And the Torah says that if you've destroyed one life, it is as if you've destroyed all of humanity. And that's exactly what the Quran says too. Right? So you're going against the teaching of your own faith. I don't like to take political sides, but I just want to give you my interpretation. So I think in this case, as, you, as we all know, that you know, one man terrorist is the other man's freedom fighter. Uh, so it is very difficult to answer that question in terms of as to who is just. Now, if the U.S. had truly been an honest broker and had an even-handed policy, could say, yes, this is right, this is wrong, and here's how, what we're going to support. Uh, and unfortunately, that didn't happen. Let me suggest that if you can sit down with his ball all day, get him to agree to something, and never be sure it's going to be followed on your part. If I think the solution in the Middle East is for Israel to conquer everybody oh. and say, let them That would be absolutely the wrong thing to do because no one wants to live under occupation and Israel or whoever it is, including the United States, would then pay the price. And if you're willing to pay that price, those people are not willing to give up. So that is not a solution. Uh, there was a hand back there and I know there's one here too. Yes, sir. So can you repeat the first part of your question, sir? Can you comment on the one last incident, one half of the size of Biden and his administration, which is the Israeli, 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 the Israeli
good question. Uh, let me first say that women and their status and role in Islam is one thing, and how women are treated by different Muslim societies is quite another. So I want you to keep that in mind. So let, let me first address the first part, all right? Just for education. Do you know that when Prophet Muhammad came, what did the Arabs use to do with their girls, new, newborn girls? They buried them alive. That practice was forbidden and stopped with the advent of Islam. Islam, in its revelation from the very beginning, gave equal rights to women, including inheritance. And there is no prohibition in Islam for women to take part in public life. In fact, during the first 100 years, there is documentation that the, there were 200 judges, I'm sorry, there are 2,000 women judges that served in those roles. I also know of a fact that the person who was in charge of enforcing the rules that you don't shortchange in weight, because one of the prescription in the Quran is justice means that if you are a shopkeeper, you give people a dollar's worth of goods. And if you're a worker, you, give, you work for, for your wages. All right? You don't shortchange. And there was a person who was in charge of that. And that person was a woman who enforced that role. Okay? So in terms of and requirements, uh, for example, requirements for modesty, the Quran clearly requires modesty for both men and women. However, it recognizes different roles for women, with, especially with the responsibility for the family and, and children. Now, how have different countries dealt with Muslims? That is the, the, uh, the deficiency of those societies, and sometimes as a result of cultural baggage. Uh, but I know Pakistan, India, Bangladesh areas, but I've visited all three countries, I know what happens. Uh, some in the Middle East, some in, in, in African American, uh, I mean African countries, you have certain customs that are totally contrary to the teaching of Islam. So just because some Muslims haven't learned to create, uh, to, to treat Muslim women uh, with respect and, and with giving them their proper rights, doesn't mean the Islam doesn't support it. And finally, I would say to you, how many, uh, how many times have we elected a president in this country who is a woman? <laughs> I can name you three, in, in, actually four, in Muslim countries. Pakistan elected Benazir Bhutto three, twice, prime minister. Her government was sacked because it was corrupt, not because she was a woman, all right? Indira Gandhi, Pakistan, by the way, India is the second largest Muslim country after Indonesia. With Muslim support, Indira Gandhi was elected and the Muslims supported her as prime minister. Bangladesh has a, minister, uh, has a prime minister uh, who is a woman. It, Turkey has had uh, ministers uh, that are serving, in, in that women ministers who are serving in that capacity. Go to Pakistan today. Schools are being run by women. Offices. Look, look at, I, I started a company in 1999 that now employs 115 people. 60% of them are women in Lahore. They're developing software. So I think our societies have a lot of work to do. I totally agree with you in terms of how people have been treated. Uh, but let's not, uh, Forget the fact that the teachings uh, are, are, you know, fair and, uh, you know, really argue for equal treatment. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, his question was, how do you deal with the institutions or organizations that treat people like me with views like me as heretics uh, who are extremists? And that's what I was referring to earlier at the very beginning, that there are those extremist groups that, that we need to deal with. And I can tell you, if I go to a mosque in, in Lahore, uh, you will hear a sermon 
that is very, very bigoted and very hateful and so forth. Um, and that's what needs to change, but I can only say that that can change with education. And making sure that if people can really truly believe, if people living in Pakistan, why, why, Pakistan of course has been the strongest ally that US has had in every crisis where Pakistan was needed, it stood with America. The president of Pakistan, President Musharraf, risked his life to go and support the US policy in Afghanistan, okay? Uh, and other decisions that, that, that people have made. But what they always say, and when I talk to the elite in Pakistan, you go to talk to them and say, look, Americans are good friends when they need us. But when they don't need us, they just walk away. In Afghanistan, in 1989, we had an opportunity, a golden opportunity, to create an Afghanistan with roads, with, with schools, uh, with, with opportunities for people that would have prevented the flow of refugees into Pakistan and with their Kalashnikovs and drugs into Karachi. That didn't happen because America walked away. So, I mean, we have a problem. So to talk to them, and I think, you know, people say, now there's another point that sometimes people make, and there is a, uh, a group that constantly talks about, and Al-Zawahiri sometimes refers to it, that we are going to now establish Islam all over the world, and we're gonna establish the caliphate. Well, that's nonsense, all right? It's not, it cannot be done. Because Islam clearly makes it an, obligator, uh, an obligation for Muslims living in minority states, in, uh, in the states where they are a minority, to observe the laws of that state, of that country, and be a part of it and be a contributor. And that's what we are doing. Okay, but for anyone to come back and say that they're gonna come and establish a caliphate in this nation state kind of a world, it's just ridiculous. Now, if we could say that with the support of America and with other countries, they're willing to help with, it, with, with, with the building of the infrastructure, because remember, many times people forget that many European countries became rich and strong because they stole the wealth of those nations. Look at India. How much was taken from India? Look at the British Museum. <laughs> and look at the mills in Scotland. And the jute mills that took all the jute from Bangladesh, brought it over there, made the jute, sold it back at 50 times the price. Think about that. So they're saying, yeah, if you're willing to come back and invest that, money with us or, you know, and create those opportunities and not give us aid. Nobody wants, uh, nobody's begging for arms. They're, they're not begging for charity. They're saying create an opportunity that is even, there's an even playing field and that we can make a contribution. Then I think we can talk to these extremists and say, you are wrong, okay? Because we can work with this system that will help the society. And that's the only way we can do that. But when we have policies that are you know, prevailing currently, and, and, and the unwillingness to, to think about alternatives and the real cost, not only to the rest of the world, but frankly the cost to this nation of what we are doing is, is horrendous. And I would just like to add one other comment. I just recently, I was telling Peter that I had to go for an echocardiogram uh, just to, to see if my doctor could give me certain medication. And the technician happened to be from Croatia. And she, we started talking about that while she was doing my test and she started talking about different things. And she said, you know, she's got kids in school and uh, one in college. She said she's amazed at the lack of protest and lack of awareness of stu by students of what's going on. Look at any major movement in different countries, how students have played a very important role in raising the voice of dissent. Not happening here because the focus of education has changed. And I think it started with President Nixon. Uh, if you remember, he cut the funding. They had cut out so many programs. And, and, and the focus on education is very, very different. And I think that's a long-term issue for us as Americans uh, to, to look at and face. Yes, ma'am. Well, 
uh, they're not going to do that because they're afraid that that's going to happen. <laughs> right, right. And, and I, you know, I, I tell you, I, I met President uh, Bush uh, last October. During the month of Ramadan, he invites uh, all of the uh, ambassadors from uh, any ambassador that has a Muslim uh, real example of what you can do and what you're able to contribute. And I've had two examples where I have sent people to senators, to ambassadors, uh, to uh, you know, other people at the FBI, in state police, uh, for a group. They are anxious, they're young, uh, they're smart, uh, one with a college, a law degree, uh, the other one just absolute dead. Four years, well, he was four years when he came from Pakistan, he's lived here all his life, right? And yet, he's driving a truck for the US Air Force. He wants to work in intelligence. They won't let him because there is still that distrust. And I think we have to overcome that because there are true, you know, believing, faithful American Muslims who want to do the right thing. Because what I said to, to all of my groups when we talked to them, I say, you know, what is good for America is good for Muslims. And a good American is a good Muslim. So I will say that to my friends that if I could say that yes, America is doing the right thing, then I think we can convince them. And we can also convince these nuts who say, we can establish a caliphate. We can say, you don't need to establish a caliphate. You can have the effect of a, of, of a society that has the, the, uh, uh, the expectations or the aspirations uh, of a successful society uh, without having to create a caliphate. But you gotta present them with something tangible. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that I'm is, not it's true. I'm that that's the perception. That, that perception. Yeah. That well, let me sh say this, that, that perception is very unfortunate because the mosques are open. We welcome uh, non-Muslims to come. We have in the mosque that I go to, almost every other week, we have a group from either a, a synagogue or a church or a school coming to observe a, a prayer or to talk with, the, you know, with Muslims. Uh, I have spoken with, you know, with synagogues and they, the rabbi, rabbi Don Rossoff in Marstown, uh, call him up and uh, he will just send me an email. Ali, I need to send 20 people on such and such date. So I will make a call to my friends. I said, please arrange it. And it's done. I was in Pakistan when he did that last time. So when I came back and I asked him, did it happen? He said, oh, yes, yes, we did. And we created more friendship. So the point is, it is totally open. And let me tell you that in the life of the prophet, there were Christians visiting the mosque. And there was a time when uh, there was a time for pay and the offer, a prophet offered them, so then you can pray here. There was no prohibition. There was one example where a uh, second caliph, Omar, was in a church, visiting a church. And the time for prayer came. And the priest offered him the, the opportunity to offer a prayer there. And he said he wouldn't do it. And you know the reason he gave? He said, if I prayed here today, some people, some Muslims, some of my supporters will say, well, because the caliph prayed here, we want to make this into a mosque. That's why he didn't do it, okay? Otherwise, I can tell you that uh, a Jewish teacher in the Bridgewater Raritan Middle School has brought 20 teachers to a mosque. We spent two hours with the Imam, sat right in the center of the mosque where we, where we normally pray, and they spent two hours talking about all the questions they had about the Imam and so forth. So please call your nearest mosque. Uh, and if you don't, give me a call <laughs> and go and visit. Absolutely no, they're, they're definitely open, especially now. Now, part of it is that people are unsure. I'll give you one example where there was one mosque in, in Somerville, New Jersey, um, and they, uh, we were inviting people. And I said to them, look, why, I want you to go to this meeting. 
because I couldn't go. It was at one of the local co community colleges, and they are close by, and I'm trying to get them to all be a part of it because I can't be everywhere. So they said, all right, we'll think about that. See who can. So I said, did you find anybody? He said, no, because we are afraid of saying the wrong thing. And if I say the wrong thing, then I'm committing a sin, and I can't do that. I said, for God's sake, here is the script, okay? I said, here's the script, you know? Here's a booklet that we've created. I said, take the script and go. Thank you very much. So that, that's the kind of concern because people are not sure of themselves. And they need to be empowered. And that's one of the things that we've been doing with mosques, by the way. And in my own mosque, I can tell you, I have challenged two people speaking from the podium while they were speaking and asked them to sit down. And I was initially criticized by the members because there was one gentleman who started speaking of hate of Christians and, Muslims and, and Jews. And I just went up to him and I told him that I've asked the imam to speak about a different subject. And everybody's stunned. I said, what is Dr. Chaudhary doing? <laughs> and fortunately, the gentleman kept quiet. He sat down and I had the imam give the lecture. And afterwards, people came to me and they said, you know, you were disrespectful to him. I said, the damage that he was going to do is much worse than anything that I, I have done. And they said, fine, we appreciate it. So the point is, you need to make people aware that these things can be done, should be done. And there were others who would challenge us for some of the things. This goes to your question. When I make a statement, there is a, uh, there's a citation in the Quran. Are we running out of time? OK. <laughs> um, OK, let me, I just want to share this with you, because this is important uh, to, to say as to what is We have a quote in this book that I brought with me, and it's available on our website also. Very introductory book on Islam. And there's a citation from the Holy Quran, and it says the following. Those who believe in the Quran and those who follow the Jewish scriptures and the Christians and the Sabians, by the way, there was a small community of Sabians at the time, and who believe in God and the last day and work righteousness shall have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. So we use this in talking about Muslim, non-Muslim relations, that there is no intolerance in Islam of other faiths because there are multiple ways to get to God, all right? And they say, oh, you're wrong, you can't do that. So I said, okay, I put it in writing. Right? I pushed, published it, I put it, I said, send me a statement in writing. It's been 18 months and I haven't heard from it. <laughs> so the point is we've got to stand up and say, say what's right. And then I think people will begin to see it. Yes, sir. Sorry? Oh, the difference between Syria and Shia. Okay, good question. First of all, there is no religious difference. The, there is no religious difference. There are some practices that are different. Uh, Shia have developed a hierarchy where the Sunnis do not. We don't have a pope, for example. We don't have a structure. We do have consultative councils that we've created. But in, in terms of following the, uh, the Quran, the example of the Prophet and the Ishtaha, there is no difference. The split came after the death of the Prophet. There was a debate about who should be the first caliph, who should take over. All right? There were people who argued partisans of Ali. That's what Shia means, partisans of Ali. All right? There were people in his uh, party, uh, people from his family who said that because he is the son-in-law of the prophet and he's also cousin of the prophet, therefore he should be the first caliph. Islam never said there is any uh, dynasty. Okay? There is no bloodline. The only way you become leader of a community is by consensus. If you rise and you earn the respect of the community, you become a leader. There is no, somebody else was chosen by the community, Abu Bakr, and there was a long fight. And in fact, the grandson of the prophet died in that battle. And in the end, as you know, in, a, in Iraq, you've seen Karbala. Karbala is the place where it happened, all right? So the whole story is really a political <coughs> battle between the two parties, and that's how those two were established, and they continued. Now about, I would say, 12 to 15% of the world population of Muslims uh, would be considered Shia. The rest is Sunni. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll come back to you. Yeah. Yes, I want to compliment you on the emphasis on justice. I heard another professor say he wished they had divorced or stopped talking about democracy and talk about justice, which 
Yes. Because I think we say that with the same Shiite pride in Iraq. Mm -hmm. We say it in this country, there are question of uh, separation of church and state is very much right. in the air. And um, I worry uh, about both countries. So it's worse in the United States. But you know, what's happening in Iraq is, again, it is not, you know, people use the word sectarian conflict. And yes, there are, there are sects. Mm -hmm. But it's not a religious conflict between the two. They're not arguing for religious superiority of one set of principles. Oh, I pray with, with, with Shia uh, and say they come to our mosque and pray with us. I can see there are some differences. For example, I noticed for the first time in Boonton, praying after many, many years, that Shia, when they stand for prayer, Sunni, the traditional, most Sunnis, would essentially, as a show of respect and as an etiquette that we learn from the Prophet, is that when you're ready to pray, you, you know, of course, prepare properly, and then, but, and then you say, you know, God is great, and then you time, sort of hold your hands in front. Sometimes people do it here, some people do it here, depending upon how they saw the prophet do it, right? Shia, hand, let their hands stand on the side. Okay? So that's not a, really, the question is, in this case, I believe, again, it's a matter of control of economic resources. If one group feels that because of the power that will be vested in one group, that they will be able to control most of the resources and the others will be deprived, that's why they're fighting. So if the US left tomorrow, I will bet you, I'm not a betting man. <laughs> it's not permitted in Islam. <laughs> that there will be fewer deaths in Iraq than we would suffer if we stayed there. <laughs> now, on justice, on justice, yes. President Bush's definition of justice is punishment, <laughs> right? Bring justice to him, right? Or bring him to justice. He doesn't, he doesn't understand the other meaning of justice. Let me read something from the Quran that specifically talks about that uh, in terms of being fair. It says, if two parties among the believers fall into a quarrel, make peace between them, but if one of them transgresses beyond bounds against the other, then fight ye all against the one that transgresses until it complies with the commandment of God, and if it complies, then make peace between them with justice and be fair, for Allah loves those who are fair. That's what the Quran says, and that's what, what we follow. Uh, there was a hand here, but let me see this was the second question. Can I take this question and the one in the back? Let's start with, yes, go ahead. Yes, he did, absolutely he did. And the Quran actually mentions the, uh, Jesus by name more often than the Bible does. <laughs> You'll be surprised. And do you know that the Quran has a whole chapter on Mary called Maryam? And it talks about the virgin birth of Jesus, it refers to Jesus as son of Mary, okay? Uh, and yes, the, the prophet absolutely respected all and mentioned. In fact, if you um, read some of the stories, you'll find that when the prophet ascends to the heaven, there's a journey that he takes to the heavens. He prays with the prophets in Jerusalem, and he also sees them on different heavens. And he sees prophet Jesus praying, he sees prophet Moses uh, uh, praying, and there's a little story that I can tell you that prophet Moses, when he met prophet Muhammad coming back from the heaven from God, and he asked him, how many prayers did uh, God prescribe for your people? And the prophet said, 50. Moses said to him, no way. They're not going to, because my people were given the same charge and they never did it. You must go back and negotiate, right? <laughs> he went back many times and he comes back until after, after the five. So Moses gave him advice on, on, on that one. You know, absolutely, that, that is true. Those are stories in the Quran. They, I'm not making it up. These are absolute uh, stories that, you know, that are in the Quran and we believe uh, them to be true as their revelation. Yes, sir. Is there some 
Just talked about those criminals. Talked about the individual criminals who committed that act. I mean, you know, we don't talk about Christian or Jewish terrorists, you know, when they commit an act of terror. Uh, so, you know, the problem is that, as I said, the, you know, the current environment is such that people feel that they have their permission to do that. And it, it should change. And I think that if we could end the conflict, all right, if we could end the conflict, and then America comes back to its roots and says, and by the way, one of the other things that you will find in this booklet <coughs> is that we show that the teachings of the Quran uh, and, and the examples of the Prophet and what is embodied in the American Constitution are very, very close. And there's an article in this, there's a six page uh, article on that that shows how, how it is. And discussion of human rights, sometimes people complain about this, Muslims don't respect human rights. Muslims were the first ones to discuss human rights before it became fashionable. Uh, and you look at the literature that, uh, that has existed. Also consider the fact that when there was inquisition in Spain, who took in the Jews? Turkey, why, did Turkey have, why does Turkey have Jews now? Why does Iran have Jews? Because the Ottoman kings took them back, gave them refuge. Because they were all being either killed or, or converted. Uh, so the point is there is a lot of history. Uh, there's a beautiful book by uh, Professor Manicol, <laughs> Maria Rosa Manicol, about the, uh, how uh, the Muslims, Christians, and Jews created a culture of uh, tolerance in Spain uh, for 800 years. People did that. So I think we can do it again. I believe we can do it again, but we need to really focus on rebuilding the society from the ground up and stop using war as a weapon. Yeah. No. Okay. Before we close, I'd like to ask us, crossing all our differences, to spend a few minutes in silent prayer for peace, however you do it. Thank you so much for coming tonight. You're very welcome. And thank yeah. you all for coming. You put this down, Shiva.